Hello, and thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar on fire safety for your ministry. My name is David Fournier. I serve as the Vice President, Chief Client Care Officer at Adventist Risk Management. Adventist Risk Management is the Seventh-day Adventist Church's insurance and risk management company. I really want to thank you for being part of uh, participating in this in this presentation in this webinar uh, because it shows that you are invested in protecting your ministry and you're a partner with us in that so let's get started today we're looking at fire fire losses and we are going to look at, at sort of the big picture of fire losses over the last five years just to give ourselves some context about what Seventh-day Adventist ministries have been facing in that area, as well as just what is happening in the industry. Uh, we're going to look at some tools, some things that we can do to protect our, our people uh, as sort of the first priority, our people, and then also the, uh, the property that we have, which can be destroyed by fire. Uh, so we're going to look at a few solutions there. We're going to start off with uh, how do we get a grip, uh, our hands around the, the risks that we have at our local facility and also what we can do to prevent fires, to improve our responses to fires if they do happen. Um, again, keeping people's lives as our first priority at all times. Um, property is, is one of those things that can be replaced at the end of the day it is a thing and while it may be valuable and certainly we would rather see mission dollars go to um, to mission and evangelism uh, we, we we can replace a building it's it's not the same with a person somebody who's injured or um, or, or or fatally injured um, you can't replace that. You, you can't fix that with any amount of money. So we want to always keep that priority foremost in our minds. So let's take a quick look here. I'm going to show you two years of industry statistics here in the, the United States uh, for these particular numbers, and then we'll, we'll broaden out as we look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church's experience more specifically. So these numbers are from 2015. Um, the next numbers we'll look at are from 2016. Uh, but in 2015, fire departments across the United States uh, responded to 1.3 million fires. Now those are going to range in a number of areas. Major categories that, that they can sort of put those fires into would include your outdoor, you know, bush, brush fires, uh, forest fires, those kinds of things. That's a, that's a large category. Home and structure fires is another category. Um, and that's where most of the injuries uh, or many of the injuries take place. And then you also have vehicle uh, fires as well, where the vehicle may be on, you know, um, on the road or not on the road, but it's a vehicle oriented fire. Some of the major buckets that we look at there. These fires, the 1.3 million fires, caused 3,280 deaths, civilian deaths, and 15,700 civilian injuries. So significant. Uh, 68 firefighters were fatally injured and 68,000 firefighters were injured. So let's look at 2016. The numbers are going to be fairly similar. Uh, 1.3 um, million fires reported, uh, so very close uh, number there. Uh, 3,390 civilian fire deaths, 14,650 civilian fire injuries, $10.6 billion in property damage. Um, so uh, that's a massive number uh, of, again, dealing with your the value of property that had to be replaced, rebuilt, or was simply lost and wasn't able to be replaced or rebuilt. So um, significant impact to uh, whoever um, is connected to those incidents. Uh, 
So let's take a look here real quick at what is the Seventh-day Adventist Church's experience. And we're looking over the last five years. That's typically how we measure property fire losses. Uh, and really, fire loss is the largest from a dollar standpoint of all of the different types of property losses that we have, whether that's wind, uh, water, lightning, uh, what, what have you. Fire has, uh, when it takes place, it may not take place very often, but when it does, it causes the largest um, impact from a dollar standpoint. Uh, recently, we experienced the largest single loss that we've ever experienced at 13.5 million, and I believe that that ca case is not closed, so um, that number may may adjust before it's it's final. Um, in that five-year period, there were a total of 132 losses. So there are other property claims, as I was saying earlier that there may be more of them. There may be a larger quantity. Um, 132 losses over five years is not necessarily a very large number for the activities of, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world, but um, the dollar impact of those 132 losses is the largest category, uh, and that's at 34 million in total. So that, that gives us a bit of an overview of what are we dealing with and the significance of this to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, fortunately, um, most of the properties that the church is managing and, and owns are not going to be dwellings. And there, there are certainly dwellings. The church owns dwellings uh, and dormitories and those types of uh, locations. But for the most part, we're talking about school buildings, we're talking about churches and those kinds of structures. Uh, the church is involved in so many different activities. So you don't see necessarily uh, very many um, injuries or deaths taking place at those, those locations. Um, and we're, we don't have those measured here, but it is still something that we need to be very careful to plan for, to plan against, uh, to have the right um, responses ready in case of, of an event taking place. So let's look at what we can do to get our hands around the solution, the problem and the solution. And one of the first things that I recommend, and Adventist Risk Management has been recommending for a very long time, is that your organization, whether it's a church, a school, uh, whatever the organization may be, no, put in place some person who can serve as your safety officer, who can be sort of the, the key person who takes um, the initiative in all aspects of safety. Uh, it's important that the leadership support this person, that they be invested in this as well, but someone needs to do some legwork uh, in regards to safety. And if that person is you, thank you so much for your partnership on uh, keeping, keeping your people safe, our people safe. Uh, one of the things that you could do first is a facility review. Adventist Risk Management has resources on our website, and you can see our website link on every one of these slides, www.adventistrisk.org. Um, and we have resources there, and among them is uh, simple forms, uh, fillable forms. You can, you can print these out and walk around with them, or you can use them on a tablet of some kind. Um, they're available on our website for free. Uh, and what these do is, is they will give you the tools to walk through a camp or a school or a church and look through the parking lot and the rooms, the hallways, looking at your fire uh, systems, you know, whether it's the, the lighting, the signage, the fire extinguishers, um, electrical issues. It's going to ask you the questions that will prompt you to look um, at your facility closely. 
it's not incredibly long. I think the church one is about 11 pages long, and you can see an example of one of those pages on the on the screen there. And some pages may not apply in your location. Um, if you don't have a kitchen, for instance, uh, you just skip past that portion. Um, there's additional resources, uh, and I'll talk about those at the end, informational pieces that will help you and your church or school um, think through what it means to be uh, ready and prepared for fire safety. So I encourage you to make use of this tool. Uh, and we're going to look at some of the things you might be finding as you look around your facilities. We've taken some photos over the years as the Adventist Risk Management Loss Control Specialists have conducted surveys at various churches and schools. And there are certainly things that we see uh, more often than not uh, that we want to bring to your attention. So we're going to take a look at a, a few photographs. Uh, the first one here, you'll notice this is actually an electrical room. You see the electrical uh, boxes on the wall. And uh, the other thing that you see, probably the thing you see most in this photograph, is a lot of cardboard boxes. This room is now being used as storage and it is being used as storage. These are flammable materials or combustibles and flammables are probably both here uh, represented. And these, these electrical boxes are, um, well, one of them is completely exposed. It's an open box, so it's not protected in that way. Um, and you have uh, that dangerous combination of storage right up against, uh, right up on the electrical boxes. That is one of the things that we highly recommend uh, be solved immediately of clean that, clean that out, use a different space for storage. Storage is always at a premium. Um, a good rule of thumb is if you haven't used it this year, uh, you may not need it at all. Uh, keep the place clean and tidy. Uh, it's amazing how closely tied um, cleanliness and good organization is to safety. Uh, and you find that to be true uh, in, in all aspects of one of these types of surveys. So let's look at a hallway. This is a, again, a unfortunately we find this type of scenario taking place quite frequently again. And again, it, it really goes back to a storage issue. And now the hallway is being used as storage. Um, and really blocking what is the exit for that part of the building. Um, a, a very important for all of us, safety officers, leadership of every, every description, to notice these kinds of parameters, to understand that this is an issue, this is a problem, and to be prepared to uh, stand up and say that this is, this is not okay, it's not acceptable, and lives are lost when um, they are not able to respond in an emergency uh, and, and get out as quickly as possible. Another area that, that we need to think about when it comes to fires, many fires take place in kitchens and many fires take place uh, in areas that have electrical um, circuits, systems, equipment. So. Um, obviously, we care a great deal about the electrical room. We looked at that earlier, but it can be anywhere where there's elect electrical equipment, and that and that truly can be anywhere throughout your facility. But what we often find are overlo overloaded circuits, where uh, we call them the Franken plug scenario takes place, where there's plugs plugged into plugs, plug <laughs> plugged into plugs, and uh, the the entire uh, systems overloaded at that point. Some of the equipment, the you know, the power strips are overloaded. Um, you're, you're just the the some of the cabling is not up to par. If you need extension cords, um, really, if you need it more than once, you you need to run 
real wiring to that location and have things plugged in uh, correctly and use an electrician for those uh, services. I know uh, often people do, you know, have experience and knowledge about electrical matters. However, um, there is a good risk management principle at work when we hire a licensed electrician to do things up to code, uh, we're able to protect ourselves um, and our organization uh, because it would be documented that it was done correctly. Uh, in the event that something still went wrong, you as an organization representing your organization can say, we did all of the things correctly and um, used the right people who were correctly licensed. So it is, it is one of those ways of uh, transferring risk and removing uh, the chance that you will be held as negligent if something were to still go wrong. Um, so very much in recommend and encourage using professionals um, to conduct electrical work. I do want to make a note here on fire sprinkler systems. Um, these are some statistics from the NFPA, um, and and really they're 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 promoting the use of fire sprinklers even in homes, and they've been pushing for that, and and they are making their way into the housing market uh, strongly. Uh, as new homes are built, many of them are being built with fire sprinklers uh, built in. And that's, that is good because they do reduce the risk of, of dying from a home fire by 80% and uh, actually putting the fire out and protecting the property uh, by 70%. And those are some pretty profound statistics. I think um, they make a very good case for wanting to have sprinklers uh, in, in whatever the location is uh, the thing that I th I think we have to think about when we think of churches specifically is how often are people on site? Um, so if a fire takes place, as it often does with these types of facilities, after uh, people are gone and there's no one there, uh, you know, if you're only meeting there Sabbath morning or perhaps a Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting, uh, that is a lot of time where that building is really empty uh, and there's not someone going to be aware if there's smoke or hear the um, smoke detector go off and that kind of thing. So having a system that will respond and actually do something about a potential fire uh, built into the system is a real uh, benefit to you. It will protect your property and, and investment to a great degree. Of course, you'll get to clean clean up from all that water, but it's better than having to rebuild completely. Um, and certainly if there are people on site, having something that will protect lives uh, makes a big difference. So let's look at some more fire safety tips that we can use in a church and school scenario. Uh, we talked about the good housekeeping and storage. Uh, you wanna keep your uh, flammables and combustibles in in a completely different area from your um, your furnace, your uh, electrical systems. They d they don't belong in the same space, and they they certainly don't belong anywhere near each other. Um, if you have a large open basement type format, I would encourage you to keep any flammables and combustibles well away from uh, both of those areas. Portable heaters, we see these uh, more often in office environments, schools, um, the, the church office sometimes has these as well. Uh, be sure that there are no exposed elements and that there's a tip over protection system involved with that unit, the portable heater unit, um, because they are, they are known to start fires as well. Keep your electrical equipment and wiring and systems well maintained. That means using professionals. That means as you walk through doing your self inspection, your self survey, using that form that that uh, I shared with you earlier, you're going to be looking for uh, any exposed boxes, uh, electrical boxes. Uh, 
and, and you'll be amazed at how often you might find that kind of thing taking place. Make sure that even if, if there's uh, work being done, um, get a cover on that. Churches and schools are known for having children visit them from <laughs> fairly regularly, and kids can be pretty curious with their putting their fingers um, into all kinds of things. So you want to make sure that uh, your electrical boxes are all buttoned up. Uh, get those covers on them, and let's not have wiring just sort of uh, draped all over, hanging from ceilings. Uh, it sounds crazy probably when I'm saying it, but go look around your facility. You may be surprised at what you find. We certainly find this on the regular basis. Uh, and again, this you won't be popular for this one, but please limit the use of power strips. Uh, if if you're needing to to you know run extension cords and your power strips are completely full, uh, you need more electrical outlets, and it's time to run. Uh, run some power outlets for real. So uh, look for that type of thing and monitor their use. Moving on to some more safety tips here, uh, defensible space around structures. This is going to help, especially in those uh, brush and uh, forest fire type scenarios. You need space that um, is defensible around your your building. Uh, so work with your local fire marshal. I, I very much encourage a, a creating a relationship with your local first responders. And this is true not just for uh, the topic of fire safety, but for a number of other emergency response issues as well. Uh, you may have other issues in your area like tornadoes. You may be in a hurricane area. Um, you may be thinking about when somebody has um, a medical emergency at your facility, or when, if you're planning uh, for the event of an active shooter situation, very important to already have a relationship with your local uh, first responders. Uh, it, we're talking about fire specifically today, so we'll talk about those first responders. Very good to bring them in ask for their you know advice their expertise they're going to give you really very effective good input so make a partnership with them i find some folks are a bit hesitant to do that because they think well if i ask the fire marshal to come in he might tell me something i don't want to hear i would rather hear bad news sooner than later it is not going to be better in the event of an actual emergency so find out what what advice, what codes, what laws they um, the in, the input that they have about that for you. Uh, they're going to help you understand how many people can congregate in your spaces, in your rooms. Um, you know, it says here a hundred feet around your structure. You need a defensible space. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like in your jurisdiction? work with them on that. Uh, fire extinguishing. Uh, this is something that needs to be serviced at least annually. Uh, you should partner with a local organization who can make sure that your fire extinguishers have been um, checked to see if they are still uh, viable. Um, and they're going to punch and keep that up to date every year. So often when I visit a facility, I find that it, the fire extinguishers haven't been looked at in you know five years or something like that um, and if you look at their pressure you know it's in the red and um, they've not been signed off on uh, really important to have that done uh, if you're going to have emergency equipment it needs to to work um, you know hopefully you never need it but if you did it had better be um, a good solution for you. Also, check on the lightning protection for your facility. That uh, lightning it can be a very um, damaging, uh, powerful, powerful force, not to mention a <laughs> scary incident when it takes place. Um, particularly outside of the United States, we have 
a large number of lightning related losses, fires that are started because of lightning. But check to make sure that your lightning equipment is correctly installed and um, well that you have some in the first place. Check for smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, uh, make sure that they are uh, working and do that on a systematic regular basis. You've heard you know the spring or fall um, to do it in, in those ways. Um, make a regular process, a regular system. Uh, if you have battery backups in those those units, create a regular process for replacing those batteries even if they may have just a wee bit of juice left in them they need to be replaced. It's not something that you want to have fail in the, in the moment that it's needed the most. I hope that you're aware uh, that Adventist Risk Management created something called Safety Sabbath. We worked with the North American Division to designate a, a Sabbath each year and it took place uh, March 24 in 2018, and it is scheduled for March 23 in 2019 uh, to be a day of emphasis on uh, life safety. You know, I think about uh, the life of, of Jesus as he was ministering in um, Galilee. He made it a priority. It was always a focus of his ministry to care for people's well-being. And that's what this is all about. What are we doing to care for our visitors, our guests, our members, our children's well-being? Um, being prepared for an emergency is one of the ways that we can show our love for them, uh, for their well-being. So I would encourage you to make Safety Sabbath a priority in 2019. Uh, you know, there are about 6,000 churches across the North American Division, and in 2018, we saw about 1,700 of them conduct uh, drills and participate in a Safety Sabbath event uh, in March. Now, we don't think that you should only do this, you know, once a year in on Safety Sabbath. Uh, this is something you are very welcome to do. Uh, more than once a year. You may want to do a drill on one topic at one time. And let's say you did fire a fire drill one Sabbath and uh, another time in the year you did, you know, looking f um, at another type of drill like uh, an earthquake drill, an active shooter drill, or uh, a missing child drill. Um, the, the resources for this are on our website. Uh, we created an extra URL there just to make it easy to remember, safetysabbath.com. Um, but if you go to adventistrisk.org, you can get there either way. Um, make use of those resources and help to educate your, your um, leadership team, your deacons, your, your elders, your pastors, uh, your s fellow safety officers. Um, and your your whole membership so that they will know what to do in the event of an actual emergency. One of the things that is really important for that as you are training your people, as you are building out your emergency plan, is to document and post evacuation routes. You should have signage with um, information about, okay, this is an emergency exit, uh, this is the direction you should go. Uh, in the event of a fire, um, making it very, very clear and obvious, uh, even for somebody who is brand new and a visitor, if the alarm sounds, they're going to be able to know exactly the quickest way out of, out of the building for that type of an evacuation. Uh, we have resources at uh, AdventistRisk.org to do exactly that and to help train and bring your whole group along as you go through this planning process. A few tips on conducting drills. Be sure that you coordinate with local law enforcement. Uh, your first priority is to safely evacuate all your persons from, from the building. Um, th this is critical. Uh, 
I would very much encourage you to get the buy-in of your leadership and, and ask them to, to participate and to lead by example. When people say safety is a priority and then they don't participate in the drill, when they say, oh, okay, this is just a drill, so I'm not going to actually leave the building. I'm going to sit here while all the rest of you leave the building. Uh, they're sending a very different message from um, the, safety is clearly not a priority for that, for that person. So ask your leadership to participate and to lead by example. Um, and, and make sure that it is a safe activity uh, for everyone. Think particularly of children, parents, parents in a, in a uh, church scenario. Let's say this takes place during Sabbath school. Parents may be very concerned and, and want to go evacuate their children. Um, so they need to understand uh, that the Sabbath school leaders um, are well-trained and know exactly where to take the children, know and are equipped to do so effectively and that um, the parent needs to evacuate as well, and that there is a plan for everyone to get back together again. Um, that knowledge becomes uh, a powerful tool to, to keeping that working very, very effectively and, and not having confusion, people running against the flow of traffic, that kind of thing. Uh, so very, very important. Designate locations that you evacuate to a safe zone meeting place that needs to be well away from the building. Uh, so where are you evacuating to? Are you staying in a group? Is there a leader to follow? Um, is there, are there people who can say, all right, we know who was in this classroom. Did everyone make it out? Is everyone here in our group at the right place? Uh, do be able to do a head count so that you can know uh, that everybody has been evacuated. Sometimes more challenge, challenging to do when you have visitors and, uh, you know, who has actually showed up for Sabbath school uh, or not this week, but still uh, an effective um, process to attempt to do. Um, and then here we have a note also on fire extinguishers. Um, really important that we only use fire extinguishers on uh, small fires that can be extinguished by fire extinguishers. So. I encourage you to actually engage in some training with that. Uh, there's nothing to replace actually having a fire extinguisher in your hand and being trained on how to use it correctly. Um, encourage you to you maybe check out some YouTube videos on how to do that. But uh, ultimately, getting one in your hands and being able to go through the process is is the best way to learn how to use those. I want to conclude with just pointing out some of the resources that we have on our website, how to conduct a church fire drill, fantastic resource there that will lead you through the process. Um, no one can do that for you. It's not an idea that you can just sort of uh, take off the shelf and say, well, um, here's, I, I bought the book. I've put the book on my shelf. I now have a plan. No, you actually have to engage in the planning process, using these tools, using working with your people in your facility. Um, and it's something that needs to be maintained, kept up over time. Uh, people come and go, uh, various uh, elements about your physical property may change over time as well. Something to keep up on and uh, nurture, I guess is the term, maintain uh, as well. So thank you so much for taking the time to learn a little bit more about fire safety with me. Thank you so much for your partnership, your participation in protecting your church or school or whatever your organization may be. Uh, we encourage you, please visit adventistrisk.org if you haven't already signed up for our free solutions uh, newsletter. Uh, we will share webinars like this one, resources like you see on the screen now, uh, as well as regular articles about real risks that the Seventh-day Adventist Church faces and solutions for those, those issues. Thank you so much. Thank you for your partnership. 
in risk management. 